Hello, this is a podcast for learners of English, and in my episodes, I talk about various topics, give some learning tips, find out about the stories of successful language learners, have fun, interview guests, and generally provide you with a resource to help you improve your English through listening. And the idea is that listening on a regular basis can be very beneficial for your English long term. But if you want dedicated English lessons to accompany your listening practice, you could consider signing up to Luke's English Podcast Premium, which is my paid subscription with episodes all about vocabulary, grammar and pronunciation. To find out more about that and to sign up, just go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, listeners. How are you doing today? I hope you're doing fine out there in podcast land, in Lepland. So this is the final episode in the WhisperLep series, Why I Should Be on Luke's English Podcast. As you probably know, this was a competition I launched last year in which listeners chose other listeners who they would like to be interviewed in an episode of the podcast. And so far, we've had five people, all of whom have managed to improve their English to a proficient level. Five people from different parts of the world who've done well in English while living in a non-English speaking environment for the most part without having English-speaking people in their family or close friends. So these have been stories of English learning success, which I seriously hope have been inspiring and interesting for you to listen to. This conversation today is with Baha from Iran. Baha, or Bahar, as I should probably say. I think that's the correct way to pronounce it. Bahar actually came fifth in the competition, but she happened to be the last person I interviewed. So this is actually the sixth episode in the Whisper Lip series, but Bahar came fifth. As you will hear, Bahar's English is excellent, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, according to her, she used to be a terrible student who hated English and who couldn't string a sentence together. But now it's a completely different story. She's proficient in English. She has a lovely, clear accent and is confident and talkative and loves this language. So how did she do it? Well, that's the main focus of this episode. Baha tells us the story of her English journey and she outlines her seven-step method for improving her English, especially her pronunciation. Yes, she's come up with a seven-step method. And to be clear, she defined this method in retrospect, meaning that having improved her English to a good level, she then looked back at what she had done and consolidated her approach into seven clear steps. And she's going to go through the entire thing in this episode for your benefit. Now, you can try to follow Baha's method, but one of the main points here... <clears throat> One of the main points here is that you can actually come up with your own method for improving your English as long as you maintain certain key principles in your learning. And you'll hear us talking about those key principles as well as the specific seven steps that Baha went through. Um, okay, so there's no need for me to add much more here in the introduction, except that you will find links to the various resources that Baha mentions during this conversation. Those are resources that she has found to be especially useful. You'll find links to those things on the page for this episode on my website. So now I will let you meet Baha from Iran currently living in Italy. And here we go. Oh, by the way, how do I say your name properly? Is it Baha, like that? Yes, that's Bahar. But Bahar. The, the way you say it is fine. It's really great. Yes, yes, Bahar. Okay. The first one is A, ah, the second one is A, ah. Bahar. Ah, Bahar. Yeah, great. And great. then there's, there's a r, there's a kind of a r, uh, Yeah, yeah, the, we, we say the R, yes, Bahar. It means a spring. If you want, you can also call me spring. My English teachers <laughs> always called me spring, yes. Really? Yes. Well, they couldn't, they couldn't call you Bahar. <laughs> they could. It was just fun to them. I don't know. It was mm. interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Well, okay. anyway, uh, Bahar, 
Hello. Great. Hello. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> Welcome onto the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted and it's a pleasure. I really want to thank all the people that voted for me. And here I want to pray that everything that I say uh, will be useful to your listeners because real, I really I'm here to help them. They're, they're, it's not really about me, but I want to give them all the tips and everything that helped me change my mindset and my approach to learning English. Yes, so mm. thank you and thank you everyone who voted for me. That's a pleasure to talk to my favorite podcaster and teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that everyone is delighted to, to hear from you too. Thank it's you. been quite a long time that we've been waiting to hear mm -hmm. from everybody. You're actually the last person I've spoken to just because, well, it took us a while to kind of get connected and stuff. I see, and it's, yes. it's, it's nice that we are now actually talking to each other finally. Mm -hmm. I've listened to uh, your interview with uh, all the runner-ups and all the, and voila, they were just great. Yes, I also yeah. particularly liked the interview with um, the last person with Michael. Michael. Yes, with Michael, it was great. <laughs> yeah. What What do you What did you sort of What stood out uh, for you in well, that conversation? The deep meanings that you talked about, some deep things, and also generally uh, his approach to language learning. It was really, um, I think, insightful and useful, and I learned a lot about um, many things just listening to that interview lovely mm. yes. in terms of his process for learning english it's, it's good that he gave us like some quite specific tips like mm -hmm. you know using dictionaries online and also mm -hmm. um yeah working with certain texts like it was called comma gets a cure which yeah, is yeah. very interesting yeah. and um i'd like to go back to that certainly so ba uh, bahar um <laughs> Great. Before we get into the English and stuff, um, I mean, um, where are you in fact? Uh, right now I'm in Rome, um, mm. Italy, and I'm in the suburbs though, very far from the city centre because our university is located here, the University Tor Vergata. I just want to give the name. And um, yes, I'm here for, I think, uh, more than a year and a half. Yes. So, and I'm studying pharmacy the second year here. Yes. Okay, studying pharmacy to become a pharmacist. Yes, yes, I'm just a student now. Is that in Italian? No, it's in English, yes. Okay, this is funny. So <laughs> you're from my, Iran. My Italian is not that great. I think no? B1, yes, B1, B2. My comprehension okay. is better than my speaking, though. Yes. You just have to use your hands a lot, right? I mean, this is the thing. <laughs> not really. This is a more of a stereotype. But no, really, um, I don't use it, but they do. It's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of meanings that they can just uh, use their hands for. Yeah, but it's beautiful. Yeah. It's part of their language. I like it. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yes. The, the the one that I always remember is the um, yes. is one where you do a, si a, a, a <laughs> gesture, which in some countries means let's eat some food. Yeah, it's like you bring your your hand up to to in front of you with your fingers and your thumb pinched together and you sort of wave it back and forth. Yes, it took me a long time to understand what it exactly means. I think it's got many meanings, but um lots of people really uh, misuse it, including me. <laughs> I misuse yeah, really? it. Yes, because it's a little bit aggressive. For example, we can't use it for uh, every question. Um, I prefer not to talk about it a lot because I may uh, make a mistake in <laughs> interpreting it. I prefer uh, them to talk about it. <laughs> but yeah. yes, it's it's um, important to know its exact usage and don't use it just all the time. You know, just to yeah. sound more and look more Italian, we need to be careful <laughs> how to use them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting points. From my experience, I've understood that, that that gesture is done when people are asking questions, but with yes, a certain exactly. attitude. So you can't mm -hmm. just say, can I have, uh, you know, no. can I have some bread, please? No, and do no, that gesture. No. It's more like, what are you talking about? It's more exactly. that kind of thing. Yes, 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 true. That's correct. You okay. shouldn't use it just with, with every simple, like, who are you? <laughs> you know, every What's simple, your name? Yes, yes, it's very aggressive, I think. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, so Italy um, about a year and a half ago. Had you ever lived anywhere else before you went mm -hmm. to Italy? Uh, living, no. But, well, I was born in Iran and I grew up there. In fact, in my hometown most of the time. Um, and then I uh, just came here. 
But it's not the first country that I, um, outside of my country, that I came to. I mean, I went to, for example, Germany and lots of other European countries when I was younger. But it, that was a kind of trip. It wasn't for living. Just holidays? Yeah. Yes, holidays. Think? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So, okay, I've got like several things I want to ask you about. I want to ask you about your experience of living, you know, abroad, mm -hmm. uh, away from Iran, and sort of if you've noticed any differences between life in Italy and life back home in Iran, and things like that. And then obviously, I want to get into the English um, stuff. So mm -hmm. we will get properly into that in a moment. But yeah, so having having uh, been brought up and, and sort of uh, grown up in uh, Iran and then moved to mm -hmm. Italy. Have you noticed any any differences between life in Italy and life back in Iran? Certainly. Well, we live completely differently in some sense because we are from east. Well, here is west. There are some uh, very bold and um, just differences. I don't want to say that it, it was bad there and it is good here. Certainly not. They have their own um, positive things and negative things. But certainly I have come here to study and uh, to just gain knowledge and learn about other languages and other cultures. And also I really like to communicate with people from different backgrounds that I think that is really useful. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity because I didn't expect it to happen at this age. I didn't expect this. Really? Uh, yes, I always thought that I maybe go abroad after my bachelor's, but then it happened earlier. I'm happy for that. How did it actually happen? Well, um, that's a long story. But as I said, I was grown, uh, I was born and I grew up in a very small town in southwest of Iran. Quite not a lot, not a particular, a particularly facilitated city. It was a small town. And mm -hmm. um, in order to grow up, as my mom said, I needed to go to a bigger city. And uh, I went to Tehran, our capital city, to study for a year. And there I attended um, a language class, an English class, just to improve mm -hmm. my English even more. And yeah. there I learned about opportunities for going abroad and study. And that was always my dream. I always loved to go to England, but <laughs> it didn't happen. Uh, for many reasons, but um, I found that there was a good opportunity to come here to Italy, so I just grabbed it. I say, <laughs> yes. Plus, you get the nice weather and then a good food as well as yes, a bonus. In fact, I'm a vegan. I don't enjoy the food as much as oh, really? other people do. Yes, but anyway, I love the fruits <sighs> and um, everything. I love it here. I love the weather as well. It's not that different to uh, the climate that I was used to. You know, that's really good because other European countries, they are far more different when we compare them, especially to my city, because I grew up in a very hot area. We mm. had a lot of sun, too much sun, maybe. <laughs> what, what's, yes. what's the sort of temperature in the summer there? Oh, my God. Uh, 50, 40, 50. What? I would say 40, 40, yes. How do you actually deal with that? Survive. <laughs> yeah. Well, I survived by not exiting the room a lot and the house. I was mostly spending the summertime um, in, in inside my house, I think, well, our house, of course. Well, Air, con I, air conditioning, right? Yes, air conditioning. indeed, without air conditioning, I think all of us would be dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but in wow. fact, yes, Iran in general is not like that. There are many cities with many different um, weather and climate, but climates. Mm. But um, our city was like this. It was in south, and that's normal. Quite, yeah. Okay, all right. So let I mean, I'll come back to ask you about uh, pharmaceuticals and stuff in a bit, mm -hmm. but. Um, so tell me about your English then. You said in your recording that in the beginning, and I guess this is like nine, ten years ago, something yes, like that. I was 11 years old, yes. Yeah, the, the English was a nightmare for you at the beginning. You used to fail your classes. You hated English mm -hmm. and listen to you now, right? So oh. so what, what went you. right? Well, yeah, well, it's true. Um, what went right? Tell me about... Okay, first of all, when did you first start learning English? What was your first contact? I will do my best to say it in a beautiful way so that other people <laughs> will be inspired a bit, although it was a really hard time for me. Well, just mm. to give a background, some background, I um, 
in um, Persian or Iran educational system, we don't study other languages and English or Arabic because they do exist. I'm sorry, but they will come uh, later. For example, not in primary school, but we start um, from middle high school. How is it called? After the age 11, 12 Secondary school. Secondary school, yes, yes. Um, and so until the age of 11, I didn't know anything but the alphabet, probably. <laughs> yes. In so, English? In English, yes. I, did, okay. I didn't have a clue, <laughs> nothing else. Yeah. And I uh, attended my first ever language class, and it was my father's friend language school. And it was a really tiny uh, city. We didn't have many language schools, but it was great in general. Um, I went there with my best friend and here I made my biggest mistake because I insisted on attending the same class as hers, even though she was two years older than me and already knew some English. So when you are an absolute beginner, that's a very big mistake because you won't understand anything. You don't know anything to begin with. So my teacher wasn't really happy with my decision, but I insisted. So... He just said, okay, come, let us see what you'll do. And oh my God, it was horrible. Every day was worse than the day before. And oh I God. didn't understand anything. Yes, I was embarrassed because each time that he asked me a question, I was just looking at him <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> I couldn't even understand the question, let alone answering it. Yes. This is the 11 or 12 year old you. Yes, yes. In a was... class with kids who were sort of two years older. A traumatic experience, I and should say. They were much better at English than you, and you just yes. were completely lost. Yes. Yeah, I know that feeling in a language classroom when the teacher's talking and the students are responding, and you're just like, what the hell is going on? I've <laughs> yes. got no idea. Yes. Yeah, that must have been pretty horrible. Very, really. And I remember that it just continued this way. I didn't give up in the middle of it, as I should have, I think. Mm. And what happened is that at the end of the course, here comes the real nightmare, uh, for the final exam, I looked at the questions and I didn't understand anything. So I wrote my name and I give it to my teacher. I handed it in blank. It was oh. really a truly horrible thing for me because I was a studious person in school and this meant a lot. I remember that I just gave it to him and I ran out. <laughs> didn't even oh. look at him. I ran out and I uh, but he knew where I was heading to. I was going to my father's photography shop because he, he was my friend's father. And he was a very caring teacher. I should say that he changed my life really afterwards. Mm. I will tell how, mm. tell you how. And um, he followed me, didn't let me go. And I remember I, uh, arrived, um, I arrived to my father's shop and he said, how was the exam? I said, good, quite good. <laughs> and I just went uh, upstairs, but my teacher yeah. went. Uh, he, um, my teacher arrived afterwards and he told my dad everything. And the fact that I gave my, uh, I handed in my paper blank and my father was quite shocked but he wasn't a kind of, you know, person to argue with me and to shout at me and say why you did it. He, they tried to solve it, even though at that point it was a bit late because I already hated English and I already hated that language school as well. I remember that just it continued this way um, until, uh, as I've mentioned it before, um, we could go to Europe for just a holiday and for holidays, we went there. And I remember that I was super, super happy because of this experience, because I always wanted to communicate with other pe people from different countries. And I suddenly understood and realized that I can't speak any uh, second languages, so I will not be able to make friends. It was really difficult for me to accept this. And it happened, really. But I started, uh, for example, learning German. I did everything with some of these travel guides and things like that. But uh, I didn't want to go to English because I hated English, of course. <laughs> but mm, then, because you had yeah. these terrible associations with yes, it. Yes, yes, exactly. We went to Germany. We went to other countries. And when we um, just went to other countries other than German, I understood that even those phrases that I learned in German are useless here. So. You know, at that point, I realized, okay, you're going to study English when you come back. Okay, now you know. 
<laughs> but this was just an incentive. It, it was really a good motivation, but it wasn't the main thing that changed um, the course uh, for me. I will tell you about what really changed it. Shall I? Yes, please. <laughs> yes. Well, when we came back, I had this in mind that, okay, I have to learn English. I will learn English, but still I didn't have a really clear idea how to do it because I didn't want to attend the same uh, language class. No way. I didn't want to go to the same school. And there was, uh, there was a book fair in our city, very tiny book fair. I went there and there were lots of these readers, these Oxford readers and yes, yeah, storybooks. And they were lovely. I've got yes. one right here, in fact. Oh. It, 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 this one is a, a Pearson mm. English reader, published by Lovely. Pearson. And this is uh, Sherlock Holmes' short stories. Oh, my God. I love Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, me Lovely. too. I've been trying to trying to work out if I can get some great. Sherlock Holmes stories on the podcast at some great, point. Great, great. Um, I'm looking for them. Yeah. I'm looking readers, forward to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too, actually. I love doing those sorts of things. Yes. Um, readers, I mean, do you reckon everybody knows what a, a reader well, is? Well, uh, it's a kind of, um, it, they are storybooks, quite, uh, they are um, suitable for English learners. They are made for them. And they are kind of graded A1 starter to C1 level, I think, advanced mm -hmm. uh, levels. Yeah. Yes, from Cambridge University, Oxford University Press. There are uh, lots of them. Penguin, I think there are many of them. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Penguin, Pearson, yes. Oxford, uh, yes. a, a whole range. Black Cat as well is another publisher oh, that yes. does them. Yes. And yes. Yeah, but they all, they usually come with read along. Is it how they're called? A CD that reads. Uh -huh. Yes, and that that is a very important part of it, uh, because that's what changed me. <laughs> the name of the book was the Gift of the Magi. I even remember the name. I have it still. The Gift of the what? Magi. Is it the way to pronounce it? I don't know. Uh, Ma M A G I. G I think. Let me just quickly check to yes. see if Colin knows this word. Thank you. <laughs> I should have done that before. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. Um, Magi. 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 Okay. Magi. Okay. Yes. Right. I didn't remember. All right, then. The Great. Gift of the Magi. Yes, yes. And it was a lovely storybook, but the thing is, it came with a CD that read along and was kind of like an audio book attached to the book. Um, and I bought this and I didn't expect to understand it. But when I went home, I played this CD. It was, I think, the very first time I heard British accent. Really? Yes, because before that, in the um, uh, language school that I attended, um, the books were basically um, American English. They were. And also our teacher spoke with a slightly American English as well. Oh, what American a pity. Accent. Sounds yes. terrible. Sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I remember that I heard that voice and the narrator had a very great, warm British, uh, had a warm mm. sound and uh, mm. b in British accent. And I understood the story. It was very strange that I could understand. It was starter level at starter level. Mm hmm. I didn't understand everything, of course, but I could understand the story. I remember I was so excited that I could understand the story that I shouted, I went to my mom, mom, I can understand English. It was really, um, I don't know, a, a moment of very great joy. I don't yeah. know how, to, yes, um, yeah, euphoria, if we can say that. Very, yeah, very, definitely. Yes. And then I didn't stop afterwards. I just kept buying these storybooks and I was so in love with them. I think I have a library of them now. <laughs> I still have right. them. And yes, this was the thing that helped me um, be uh, enjoy learning English, in fact, and be interested in doing it, even though I already had this motivation that I need this language because I couldn't communicate with other people when I went to um, Europe. But also mm. these stories, really, because I also love stories a lot, even in my uh, Persian, in my native tongue, even in Persian, I listen to stories, tales and um, things uh, like this a lot. So, yeah, I think that was what uh, changed uh, everything. And also the British accent, I should say that, because this was different to American. I had that negative association with American accent, you know, and also ah. the sound of British always seemed more beautiful to me. I don't want to say that 
uh, American is bad or anything like this, <laughs> accent discrimination, no. no. But I love uh, British sounds. And also afterwards, I watched Harry Potter, Sherlock Holmes, and then I really fell in love with it. And yeah. I started learning the accent as well. Yes. Okay, so it was these storybooks, these graded readers that really yeah. kind of got you. Yes. So did you just listen and read at the same time what what were you doing just listening just reading ri listening and reading mm -hmm. what was the process with well, the, with the readers uh the technique that i want to talk about about podcasts that will um give detailed information about how i usually use the piece of language that i had a podcast or a, a book but these books were mostly uh we're not exactly using this seven step technique that i will talk about later oh yes. you've got a seven step <laughs> technique <laughs> Oh my, oh my that goodness. That was for po podcast though. For, okay. um, for lang, for, uh, readers, I just used to listen to this, uh, each chapter because they are divided in chapters. I like that. I listened to one chapter a day and I just looked up all the words and I listened to it again. I tried to kind of read the book out loud just to enjoy, you know, but I didn't do anything else. That was all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. For uh, every day, one chapter, I listened to it, I looked up the words and I listened to it again. That's it. Okay. okay. Yes. But I usually, I, I enjoyed the story a lot. I've read lots, especially because they, I think they are really cleverly designed. Some of them are um, uh, kind of simplified versions of classics. And of course, what better than classics? Um, I think they're really beautiful. Yes, the stories are deep and they have... Um, meaning which uh even though i think there are all the, also some other books nowadays that they're not uh full of these uh beautiful stories i don't like some of them but um, the ones that i listened to mostly were classics for example there was one much ado about nothing the shakespeare play Sh of shakespeare play and i loved it i absolutely loved it i listened to its um audiobook many times and i think it's it was one of the um one of my all-time favorites in readers yes this is very interesting but the the graded version yes i expect is not yes. the same as the yeah, original I think text was, yes i think it was at intermediate level later right six, yes so i guess then that the graded version of a shakespeare play will be written in pretty much plain english Yes, yes. But also it was uh, with, um, I don't know, is it called theatrical audiobook? So there okay. are many people that are reading the dialogues and it's it's interesting. It's more interesting. There, for example, you can hear the sound of the horse and um, everything, the background uh, yeah. sound as well. That made it a better experience. Yeah, wonderful. Have you ever uh, read or heard any original Shakespeare? Yes, The Tempest. Now I do it a lot. <laughs> I do a lot. Really? I, I, I don't want to say that I'm an expert because certainly I'm not, but I uh, care about literature a lot, both Persian literature and English literature, because I, I can only access these two in their original uh, language. And um, for example... There are many of them, and I've already bought. Um, I've ordered two other to come <laughs> because I think that <laughs> I prefer them. Um, when, for example, I prefer to read classics rather than um, modern novels and things like that. At least, first of all, I think I should read them. And for Shakespeare, I love Much to Do About Nothing, The Tempest, and many more. But these. Uh, the Tempest, I think, is the only one that I have um, actually. I've watched the play in, but the play was fully in the original. They were using the book, yeah. yes, unabridged. Uh, unabridged, script. yes. I've also read uh, the Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare, the um, uh -huh, kind of okay. simplified version of that is yeah. for meant for children in the past, but that was mm -hmm. really useful. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's it's amazing though that you read Shakespeare these days. Mm -hmm. Even something like The Tempest, which is one of the more strange and d mm -hmm. uh, difficult to understand plays, yes. um, and but the the text, the prose is like very different to English today, yes. isn't it? I mean, do, how do you how do you manage that? Do you actually understand the the prose? Because you know, I've seen lots of plays before because I grew up near Stratford where mm -hmm. you know Shakespeare was born and there's a oh. big Shakespeare <laughs> okay. company there mm -hmm. my parents would take my brother and I to see mm -hmm. Shakespeare plays there quite a lot and uh it was almost un it was almost impenetrable English um I never knew what the hell was going on 
in the beginning, I feel the same. Every time that I, for example, try to enter a world of English, because there are many worlds I, in terms of time, they, they are really different to the modern English. At least it, it is comprehensible if you work on that. If you listen to a lot of them, then you can manage, understand, especially. And I think I have one experience. I listen to the audiobook, the theatrical audiobook. I still love them. But right now, not the readers, the uh, main world works the original books audiobooks uh the yeah. one Tolkien works i think i've listened to Tolkien books audiobooks more than two times so about 80 hours or something i love it i absolutely love the talking yes. books yes a lord of the rings hobbit silmarillion I don't know if I pronounce it right or not. No, no, you did pronounce it right. It's just my stupid brain is is now trying to think of a joke about uh, talking books. Oh, talking. Talking, <laughs> talking books, audio books. Do you yeah, really say it also... like this? Talking or talking? I think <laughs> no, I should no, say no. that. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the, the author's name is Tolkien, um, J.R.R. R. Tolkien, yes, yes, but it sounds a bit like talking. Yes, it does. <laughs> and talk, talking books, that's another word for audiobooks. They're yes, also you have a genius books. brain for jokes anyway. I don't yes. know if I do have a genius brain. I think it's maybe more of a problem than an asset. <laughs> but the other the other joke is, what was it? Um, uh, <laughs> um, I, I, last night I was, um, I, I had a dream uh, about Lord of the Rings Mm-hmm. right i had a really okay. really vivid dream about lord of the rings and when i woke up my brother told me now that's it i had a dream that i'd written lord of the rings very vivid dream and when i woke up my brother told me that i was talking in my sleep yeah <laughs> great i think it i can do be like successful. that but yes yes that's not mine though but i do like oh. that joke i was i was to- talking in my sleep because he was literally talking <laughs> in his sleep but also because he wrote lord of the rings in his sleep he was jr jrr talking in his sleep anyway um yes. okay wow so so you listen to the works of jrr tolkien including what lord of the rings and and, and the silmarillion and all of that yes. stuff Yes, yes. Oh More than God. once. It's because um, I learn a lot from them, not only the language, of course, but the meanings. For example, there are some uh, themes like eternity, friendship. Um, you know, there is a kind of, there are some ethereal um, beauties there that I think they are not repeated in every work of art. I think maybe there are uh, hundreds of books, not millions of books that are like that. So... Uh, I don't want to lose them, just occupying myself with some books that are really um, famous now and everyone are reading them, but they're forgetting classics, for example. I really don't like that. I think we should first read classics, at least the greatest books, like not only in in English and Persian, but at least translated versions of other um, world's literature as well. That's one part of my education, but I also enjoy it. It's my um, hobby as well. Yes. Uh, The audiobook was a very useful um, audiobook for advanced learners as well, I think it was. But can I um, say who uh, was the narrator? I don't know about the pronunciation of his name. Phil Dragash, something like that. I will send it Mm. to you because let's see. um, This is the guy who read out which book? um, Lord of the Rings. Okay. And there is a theatrical version, uh, yes, Phil Dragash. It's P-H-I-L-D-R-A-G-A-S-H. I don't think I know the actor. Uh, well, I think he should be more famous because his work is really a masterpiece, in my opinion. I, I'm not the kind of person to listen to something more than twice, but I've done this for this, even though it's about 40 hours or something. I think for uh, some uh, copyright reasons, people cannot find it that easily online now. I have the version, though. I've saved it. Yeah. There is, yeah, there is also a Hobbit um, that someone else has tried to follow the same method that Phil Dragash used um, and read Hobbit as well. That is lovely as well. They can find theatrical uh, audiobook of Hobbit, The Hobbit, in the YouTube. It's free on available. It's a true joy. <laughs> Um, just a note about Phil Dragash. So just Googling him, um, mm-hmm. I don't get... 
uh, he has a website where you can see he's you know like the details of the books he's read out and stuff Mm -hmm. but there is not a lot of stuff on him it's not like he's got an imdb page where he's been on tv shows and films and things like that it looks like he's only he's only only done these um uh, an audio books the lord okay. of the rings and maybe some others but it's mainly the lord of the rings that's what he's famous for mm-hmm. okay all right interesting tip <laughs> so the, the steps we've had is um you went to this language school and uh mm-hmm. it was a horrible experience yes. and then you had the chance to travel you learned some german that was great mm-hmm. but then you realized oh if i want to speak to other people it's got to be english I need so to. you change you sort of changed your motivation and decided that english would be the thing you would go for and you discover the um, graded readers with the CDs and you would listen to them and read them. I think enjoyment is the key, yes. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing this. And it kind of became suddenly from something really um, difficult and um, boring to something enjoyable and lovely, yes. that Interesting. Yeah. Also interesting that the horrible experience was one way you were with other people and um, there was pressure there, maybe because the teacher knew your dad and your friend was there and everyone was older than you. And then with the with the graded readers, it was just you and the English and it, you just did it at your own pace in your own time. And you British chose to do it as well. Yes, British accent as well. It was different, a different too. English. Yes. But anyway, I came back to that language school when I uh, worked on my English on my own for a couple of years. And my teacher was really happy that I had made that progress. And he encouraged me um, in an unbelievable way afterwards. I think that he was probably one of the main reasons I continued studying very hard because he he kept encouraging me all the time. And um, I think he has been probably my best teacher ever or one of my best teachers ever. Yes. Can I mm. say his name just in his uh, honor? Yeah, of <laughs> yes, Mr. Mohammadi. Yeah. It was his name, Feridun Mohammad. It's a bit difficult in English to pronounce it in an English way. I said it in a What? Mohammadi is his surname. The name yeah. is Feridun. Feridun is a very ancient Fel- name. Yes. Feridun Mohammad. Yes. Feridun. Yes, okay. great. <laughs> So he encouraged you. So, so yes. after about a couple of years, then, of you just being stuck into uh, these graded readers, and I guess getting, you know, going up in the levels as you, yes. you understood okay. them more and more, um, were you actually recording words that you picked up? Because you said you were looking up some words you didn't know. Were you recording them at all, or, yes. or just yeah, um, you were on the book itself? I wrote them. I underlined some of the words, for example, and then I mm. wrote the translations or definitions. Um, so that I could see it on the same page because I used to go back to them, I'm, especially the, for the ones that I love the story. I went back to them and I listened to them again. I reviewed them. Yes. it's And, and yeah, you knew the pronunciation because you were hearing, you were listening to the CDs as well. So that's yes. great. The, the CD was the main thing. I wouldn't buy a book, a reader, if it didn't come with uh, the CD because I love that voice. I love that British accent with it, you know. And usually, yeah. I also read some American ones, but I really didn't enjoy them as near as uh, the ones in British. That was just my preference. Mm. Preference. 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 Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To prefer something, but yes. it's your preference. Yes, yeah. exactly. I check that. Sometimes I have to check these words stress. Now that I'm a teacher, it's really important. But, well, it's not perfect. So sometimes I say some very obvious words with a wrong stress, and I have to check it. But uh, How do happened. you check? Yes, I. How do I check? How do you check? Yeah, I go to. Uh, I use uh, online dictionaries, and I look at that mark that shows the stress. I also listen, and then yeah. I just try to remember how to pronounce it correctly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. What was your actual functional English like after two years with the graded readers? Were you able to actually have a conversation, or when someone spoke to you, hi? Baha, how are you? And you'd say, this is an audio book from Pearson <laughs> Publishing. I'm fine. You know, well, how, how were you in conversation? Actually, I kept using those uh, readers for two years. And then I went to the language school again. And um, it was something parallel. I used the books and also I attended school. And I used to talk to myself a lot, that monologue technique. I just like a crazy person. I went around the uh, house and talked to myself. For example, I used 
used to describe what am I doing now? I'm studying yeah. English. I'm doing this. Or I talk to an imaginary friend, something like this. But mm-hmm. I used, to, because I loved that accent, as I said, the book itself wasn't, um, my main interest the cd that came with it was what i loved so i used to uh, Im- kind of imitate it and um say things as well i wasn't really that great but um i should say that it was what encouraged me to study more and i did study other skills as well mm-hmm. yes especially mm-hmm. i used british council website bbc learning english websites there are some free courses some kind of these uh when there is a course a kind of small program that is free available to you and it's self-paced um i really love these even for university i use them for university subjects and i used to use them for english a lot so in addition to that um i worked on them i think all of this together helped me to build my Mm. skills yes so then was there another step then? I guess we're looking at about 16, 15, 16, 17 years old. What, what then happened? I started working on my accent um, because before that, well, yes, but I was listening to British English, but it wasn't that I was imitating the accent. I wasn't really aware of those nuances and those special things that there are that you need to learn, very detailed uh, sounds and things like that. So... Uh, I started working on my accent since I was um, 17, 16, I think mm-hmm. 17, yes. Mm-hmm. So I, that, at that time, I discovered podcasts. Before that, I didn't uh, use podcasts a lot. That was all readers and things like that. So yeah. um, shall I tell you about that seven-step method? Yes, <laughs> please do. This is amazing. The <laughs> but- seven-step method for improving your English with podcasts. I hope that, by the way, I hope that you're going to turn this into like a, a PDF download that people have then already, have to... I have already you, made a kind of... Um, I've wrote something down. It's like a picture. It's not a PDF. But I can also turn it into a PDF. Yes, I've prepared it to send it send it to you. <laughs> oh, wonderful. An, an infographic. Yes, yes, exactly. Oh, we <laughs> like those, don't we, on online? Yes. Okay, so come on. Tell us your seven-step method. This okay, is brilliant. First of all, I don't want to claim that... I have created every single step of it certainly some of them are really famous like transcribing but the thing that I think makes it more useful and effective is all of them together in this organized way and the fact that you listen to each episode of the podcast seven times that's the thing that makes it different yeah oh wow (laughs) well I, I really don't know if it's that great but I think it's going to be useful at least I hope so Mm-hmm. Okay, so first of all, there is a step zero. I think there is zero one and zero two. There's step oh, so it's eight. It's an eight step program. <laughs> no, no, no. Then. You don't have to repeat those. <laughs> uh, it's just in the beginning. You have to do okay. that. So, of course, when I say you, I don't mean you, Luke Thompson. You don't need to use this method. Well, I I'm... should with with French. I I think <laughs> well, it would probably be a good I'm, idea. Yes, I'm using it for Italian as well. But um, I'm talking to Lepsters now. I think it's better this way. Mm -hmm. So um, step zero one is learning the sounds and building blocks of the accent that we want to acquire. So for me, I use the great course that is called, I've written the name here, The Sounds of English by BBC, uh, Learning English. It's a lovely course available free online on YouTube. And I think it's about 40 episodes, very short episodes. There we learn about the phonetic alphabet. Is it phonetic alphabet? Yes, about the building blocks, the sounds. And um, I think it's really the fundamental thing because you want to acquire the accent without knowing how to uh, pronounce uh, sounds individually. How can I expect myself to say a word like, for example, ethereal that I said before, or enthusiastic? Mm. There are diphthongs and these combined sounds. We need to learn them, especially for British. There are lots of diphthongs, I think. And they are really lovely. Mm. Uh, I think it's worth working on. So that course is step one. Just use that course. I think I worked on it for about two to three months, just on that. But is, is this one with a woman, and you see yes. the video of, of, of her mouth in yes. two from two different 
exactly. and camera angles <laughs> and you kind of copy what she's done. Yes, yes. I always thought that was a great course and that, that not enough people – uh, exactly. mentioned it but mm. yeah that's a good tip okay, that was the so treasure i found scenes. yes and i remember i just because i already loved the british accent it was the time that i discovered harry potter as well by the way i'm <laughs> a harry big harry potter fan huge harry oh, yeah. potter fan yes really? and this was um very um uh, useful i used to listen to um listen to this course and just repeat these sounds. My mom thought I was crazy and I was wasting my time at that point. But really, <laughs> yes, now she says that I'm happy that you did it because now you love to speak with this accent. So it was useful, really. So, yeah. Have you, by the way, have you heard the audiobook versions of the Harry Potter series? I think yes. <laughs> because, you know, they, they were released, I guess, within the last five years or so. They're fairly new. And they, they're recorded by Stephen Fry. I don't no, know that, that Stephen version, Fry. I haven't heard it. No. Okay. Because I, I mentioned that because, you know, Amber, you know, my friend Amber. Yes, I do. Her mm -hmm. son, I Hugo, is completely addicted to listening to <laughs> Harry Potter audiobooks mm -hmm. um, and um, the Stephen Fry versions. Mm -hmm. And now Hugo just kind of talks like a like a novel he talks like uh sort of written literary english it's amazing and so he's yeah he's got all this amazing vocab and uh it's really impressive and he knows all the magic spells by the way how house uh, which house are you in have you taken the test um no I, d I don't think i have taken the test no i mean I've, there's a few online ones which i have probably taken Mm -hmm. The but one I, I that is in the Pottermore website. Okay, maybe the I Pottermore will send website. It. Yes, yes, maybe. Yeah, I send it to me. I'll have okay, to take it later. Well, what house are you in? Ravenclaw. <laughs> okay, is yeah. that good? I mean, yeah. I've read all the book. I have read all the books, but uh, Ravenclaw love... is it's it's not Slytherin. That's the most important no, thing. No, exactly. Right? Yes, but I always love to be in Ravenclaw. I'm happy. Ravenclaw or Hufflepuff. In fact, I prefer these two. Anyway, let's not get into too much detail about. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay, the seven step method. Yes. So, uh, yes, so that was fundamental step to learn. The, even if someone wants to learn American accent, they need to learn the, uh, the phonetic alphabet and also the sounds, how to say them correctly. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a step one. And st no, that was step zero one. Step zero two is choosing a podcast. <laughs> Because it should okay. be one podcast with a uh, series so that there are lots of episodes that you can work on, not just one single episode in, in an unorganized way so that you need to look for the next one with lots of effort. It shouldn't be that way. Yeah. So um, choosing a podcast, and there are some criteria, I think. Uh, it should uh, be um, standard and the native podcast, of course, and you should like the voice of the podcaster, at least the main one, because you need to listen to it a lot. Um, yeah. And also, it should come with a transcript. I think that, for example, LEP Premium comes with a great transcript. And uh, mm -hmm. there is the, some projects, some of your normal episodes come with transcripts as well, right? Yes, that's right. A lot of them do have transcripts. Yes, great. Certainly the, the first, like the first i don't know how many episodes but mm -hmm. numbers one to something all have transcripts mm -hmm. yeah. loads of them have transcripts uh, a lot of them don't as well mm -hmm. so it's kind of like potluck you've got to go to the website page and have a look mm -hmm. and see if there's a transcript there also there's the transcript collaboration and they've done like hundreds and hundreds of episodes mm -hmm. too and they are a lot of them are uh, are uh, checked they have then they may be like 99 percent accurate a lot of them great great um so yeah there are many episodes have transcripts you might have to look a little bit to get them but they are they are there by the way i think this step is already ticked because lefsters will choose lep because they need to love this podcast and um i think that the fact that they are still listening to your podcast even though there are i don't know thousands of episodes 700 800 episodes i think it's it means that they are really loyal to your podcast so that's great because choosing a podcast may be a headache in the beginning i remember that at my level i couldn't use your podcast because i wasn't still ready to use your podcast mm -hmm. um and even uh, i should say that i didn't know it maybe i did use it but i didn't know about it unfortunately i discovered yeah. your podcast about two years ago yes how, but I'm how happy did you discover um uh, I think by recommendation in YouTube, but not by Lucy, by another YouTuber. I don't remember who. Uh, I wonder who that was. 
Okay, but yeah. it's recommended to you on YouTube. Okay, yes, that's yes, interesting. Yes. Lots of people mm. recommend your podcast, by the way. <laughs> oh, that's nice. So, yes, so I um, I used the British Council Elementary Series. Um, I think it was really useful, for, especially for lower level students. That was great. Mm -hmm. Yes, I used that podcast. And um, <clears throat> so now let's get into it. There are these so seven steps. Choose a podcast. So you yes. learn the phonemic script yes. and, the, and the sounds of English and choose mm -hmm. a podcast that you like. Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so now uh, these steps are going to be repeated each week. And seven steps for one episode. So you're not going to work on uh, different episodes in one week, just each week, one episode. And each step is for one day. By the way, mm -hmm. I have made it a bit cleaner, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't uh, like this. I really did follow these steps. That's what I did. So step one. Did, sorry, b before you started following these steps, did you plan this all out in, in advance? You think, right, I'm going to create a seven step program or did it just happen organically? And then you afterwards, you kind of applied the seven steps to what you had already done. Maybe it happened organically because I wasn't a language expert, of course. I couldn't say that, okay, I am, for example, a linguistic. I'm going to create um, a scientific method. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I even didn't know about the names, for example. They, I think I've heard it from lots of language learners that you come up with ideas and you come up with methods that are actually created, but you come up with them because you want right. to use it correctly. And it, it's, it's strange, but I think it's um, something we can do. Um, it comes itself. So, uh, step, I think that I listened to this podcast. I loved it so much. I wanted to use it in the best way possible. And I had that background from readers as well. I tried to combine it with those. And at the end, I uh, found out that I'm repeating these steps. So I made it a bit more clear. Yes. So mm -hmm. Step mm -hmm. one is just listening and enjoying. Very simple. Day one. Uh, step one so you choose for example episode one and then you listen to it and enjoy without looking at the transcript just that and day mm -hmm. two day two we listen to the same podcast but this time we write it so transcription very simply so really? the length what, the of, yes the length of yeah. the podcast is important it should be about 15 minutes to 40 minutes at most but for your podcast i think they can just divide a podcast in two that's not a big deal yeah. they can make yeah. it into segments yeah so and or just transcribe 15 minutes and yes. you don't have to worry about the rest yes, yeah. yes but the thing is they should work on the same 15 minutes for that week if they choose only 15 minutes it doesn't sure. mean that yeah just because they built upon each other the steps. Now yeah. I'm talking in a way that I'm a scientist. <laughs> I'm not. No, this is wonderful. This is great. <laughs> Seriously, we are all we're all like gripped. This is really good. Okay. When good. there's whenever there's an odd number, when there's a number of steps, and that is an odd number, everyone's <laughs> like, "This is amazing." <laughs> like if it, if it was the six step uh, program or the eight <laughs> step program, people would be like, "Ah, never mind." But because it's seven. Seven Somehow. is a uh, sacred number as well, by the it way, is, but it's yeah. in days of the week as well. So they can organize it in that way. It's a magic, magic number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So step two and three, both of them are transcribing because it takes time, even if it's a 30 minute podcast. For me, it was 30 minutes. But let me confess that I didn't transcribe all the time. Sometimes I skipped this uh, step because it's a bit time consuming. But at one point in my language learning, I did transcribing um seriously so i now put it into this method because it will make it more complete yes yes okay so uh day two and three you transcribe because for me at least i can't finish it in one setting i think more than one day is required even if it's a 30 minute podcast so day yeah. two and three we listen and transcribe one question how long are you spending in days two and three on transcribing for a 30 minutes? minute podcast one hour each day it's quite a fast transcribing rate, I have to say. So, oh, an hour each day. So that's two hours for thirty minutes uh, uh, episode. Okay, okay. Mm, Twenty minutes, thirty minutes. As I said, I didn't always transcribe, but maybe yeah. it took more days. It's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of not precise. Not thing. set. It's yes, not set it's in not stone. Yes, yes. But but um, in in any case, you're working for about an hour a yes, day. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. For a twenty mm -hmm. thirty minute podcast, and um, then. We will come to um, 
checking the transcription. So day four, I'm looking at my notes because I want to say that correctly. So mm -hmm. day four is checking the transcription with the original one. That's why I said it should come with a transcription or a sh at least you should have, a, as you said, that project for your podcast or some of them do come with um, an original one. So they need to uh, check it with that. Of course, they will have a lot of mistakes. Probably they shouldn't be uh, disappointed or anything like this. That's the point. And we should look up the new words. That's one thing. It can be uh, very intimidating to use um, dictionaries uh, now because you are putting a lot of effort into this. And when you want to learn everything about a word, it will take you forever. So just try to stick with the meaning that is related to the context, at least for this method. Yeah, I guess because often words have many meanings. And I guess what you can do is you found your word in the context yes. and you search for the meaning that matches that yes. context. And it just can even don't worry be in our native tongue. Sorry, that was a, an overlap in internet. You were talking, I was talking as well. That was because I mm -hmm. got your voice a bit later. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, yes. Yeah. Um, so where, 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 I, where was I? So we, we, we were saying that uh, when you're checking the transcript, new words that come up, you check them in a dictionary and you find the, de the definition that matches um, and maybe look at all the examples and stuff yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. And get to know these new words. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, then you, you can write that. You can correct your own transcription. That would be useful your own transcription and then, or you can use the original one from now on because now comes the part that I think is useful for accent. And mm -hmm. step five is lip syncing. And I think this mm -hmm. is not really common, at least with shadowing, it's not done in this way. I'm not sure, maybe it is, maybe you've already talked about that, but I came up with it because I couldn't shadow. So I came up with this. It's hmm. that, for example, and we need to lip sync for two days. I will explain exactly how. For day five and six, both of them are lip syncing. But it's not that you continue. You need to repeat it more than once. So it's not that you do it in two parts. So half of the podcast in day five and half of it in day six. Even yeah. if you do this, you need to repeat it. One round will not be sufficient. I think so. So so it could be like five minutes of lip syncing and then you rewind and you do that five minutes again immediately um, kind of thing. In fact, that's how I did it. I listened to the podcast and it was divided into paragraphs. So I listened to the paragraph and I tried to uh, form the shape of um, the mouth that the speaker was having. So for example, you're, um, I say, hi, Luke, how are you? And I would say, I cannot show this on the podcast. I'm So, making, so listeners, yeah. Bahar is is mouthing the words mm -hmm. so exactly. essentially lip syncing is just like when you're lip syncing with songs yes exactly. you 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 kind of repeat you kind of pretend that you're the one saying the words exactly. but you don't make any noises you That's just the form the shape of your mouth yeah. The reason hmm. why it worked because then you will make the sound later at step seven but the reason why I don't make the sounds first, I think it's useful because you don't judge yourself in this way, because the, the, men, the minute, the moment that someone uh, tell us to repeat and then we repeat, but we make a very funny version of that, not correct version of this, we get disappointed because we judge it. We say, oh, it wasn't like this at all, because we haven't given enough time to our mouth and our tongue to shape the, because I think that's one of the fundamental things. We need to use our voice and also our mouth, but it's not trained yeah. to do that. So it's better to train it first and then um, try making the sound. Yes. Yeah, so day five. That makes sense. That makes <laughs> sense. I, and I really like the fact that you're thinking outside the box because a lot of people would just not even consider sitting there mouthing along to a podcast. The podcast you know? should be useful it should be interesting as well i think i love the topic of the podcast but it was that desire to make the sounds in that way i i really mm -hmm. had this desire and after some time it becomes like a game it becomes like a game and you may enjoy doing this as well so yeah. that lip syncing um i didn't produce any sound even uh, on day five and six not at all. So I just listened to the whole podcast. I used to um, just paragraph by paragraph. I stopped a bit in the middle so that I 
especially on day five, the first time that I tried to lip sync, I couldn't follow the speed of, of course, obviously, I couldn't follow the speed of the speakers. And I made some silly kind of mouthing. It wasn't mm -hmm. co corresponding to every single word, but it was mm, approximately okay. Mm -hmm. So that was mm -hmm. for day five. But day six, it became better because I repeated again. Yeah, the whole yeah, process. Yeah, yeah. I repeated it, yeah. and on day seven, this is a combination of lip syncing and shadowing. This time, on day seven, you're going to actually see how your uh, voice is going to respond to all of that training. So now that you've given your mouth enough time to uh, understand how to shape the words, now how it will become with the sound, and I'm sure that it's going to be better than trying uh, in the first place using your sound as well. Yeah, and and by shadowing, you you basically mean doing mm -hmm. what you were doing before, but you're making noise. So you're talking um, along with the, your your repeat. It's not it's not listen and repeat. It's just like simultaneously saying what you're hearing. Are you looking at a transcript as well while you're doing yes, that, or yes. are you just yeah you are okay? So you're reading yes. aloud and listening and reading all at the same time. Actually, I'm I'm not sure if I should call it shadowing because as you said, shadowing is what you said, but it was lip syncing each paragraph. You should divide it in your mind in paragraphs, or it should be in divided it self in paragraphs mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so I listen to the um, podcast paragraph by paragraph I uh, at the same time I do lip syncing again while each paragraph so I lip sync I stop and then I read it aloud and I yes. listen to the paragraph again this time I check so I will say yeah. it again I listen I lip sync I stop then I read it out loud and my yeah. mind has received it just now, the way that I sound like. And then I listen to the same paragraph again. And mm -hmm. this way I'm checking. I'm checking uh, whether I'm correct or not. Afterwards, you can do the shadowing. But personally, I don't love shadowing at the same time simultaneously. It makes me crazy when two <laughs> sound, two noise, it's too, yeah. too much noisy, you know. When, yes, I see. Yes, yes. That's why it's like repeating out loud, not shadowing. Yes, yeah, so it's listen and repeat or yes. reading aloud pretty exactly. much, um, mm -hmm. I see. Can I ask which – so you were doing this with the British Council Elementary Podcasts, mm -hmm. and did you ever do this with episodes of my podcast or, or, or not? Because mm -hmm. – Honestly, I worked on these series, the series of um, uh, British Council for about two years, but yeah. I didn't do it every week, one episode. It wasn't a kind of perfect um, every week process, but it was continuous. I was always kind of using this game technique, but for about two years, I gave myself uh, time and I worked on about 30 episodes in total, not more than that. Okay. But then I kind of became a bit tired of using the same method. So I use your podcast, especially the LEP premiums, just the way you say. So I use the methods you have recommended on. Right. Yes. You also have that kind of repeating after me. And I think at this level, that's more useful for me, um, mm -hmm. the way that you do it. Because this technique, this seven technique, I think is um, very useful for people who are trying to start to make these sounds. It may be mm. useful now with your podcast, I think, but maybe I have more important um, things to learn because I'm a teacher as well. So... I spend less time, but I use the techniques that you uh, have tailored to your podcast. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks for mentioning uh, LEP yes. Premium, yes. by the it's way. It's great. It does have that. You produce these. I think you can explain about them much better than me. The way, uh, by the way, listeners, we haven't arranged this. I am really <laughs> authentically telling this you about it. This is genuine. <laughs> yes, this is genuine, really. Uh, the, so the I'll way. Pay, I'll pay your, your 20 euros for being <laughs> the post, okay? <laughs> Oh, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> but exactly. yes, I have a I have a particular set of skills. I mean, I have a particular method mm -hmm. that I use Indeed. in the premium, which is essentially, yeah, I've broken it down too. I, I didn't come up with a, an odd number. I should have done seven <laughs> step technique for using LEP premium. But essentially, it's like listen to the original episode. Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's say it's a conversation with my dad. Mm -hmm. And then listen to the premium episode and follow along with the PDF and, and mm -hmm. sort of read and listen at the same time and read through all my notes. And then um, 
at the end of that do the memory test which involves taking you know there's extracts from the previous episode and people mm-hmm. have got to just remember the words and mm-hmm. then there's listen and repeat after me so pronunciation drills focusing on sentence stress and word stress and connected speech mm-hmm. and weak forms and all those mm-hmm. important little technical things and then after going through all that process uh, listen to the original episode again Mm-hmm. and um, you'll notice so much more language and it kind of reinforces itself. And then later on, go back to the notes, the PDFs, and go through them, sort of self-study and test yourself yeah. again and just kind of keep going round and round like that. Yeah, so I didn't have that kind of a facilitated version of a podcast like yours. So I just tried to create this and I don't want to say that I created every step. As you see, all of them are already out there. But all of these together... I, I remember that, for example, at day eight, I had memorized the podcast. So maybe I could say it just out loud. And yeah. yes, so the expressions will always stick in your mind as well. This is this is amazing. So when did you start to experience like significant gains from using this method? I think very soon, but not that early, probably after a couple of months at least, working on four or five podcasts. And did you did you do this every day then for that period where you're doing something? I said it wasn't your- perfect, but yes, every day. But maybe some weeks I didn't repeat it. Some weeks there were some gaps, but not huge gaps. I did continue mm-hmm. doing this. But given that, well, I only use this method for my accent. I have never had any native friends. I've never had any native teachers. I've never been to Britain. These things can be super important and super useful. But I didn't have this opportunity to... I think the very first native teachers that I had were my CELTA trainers. <laughs> so, yes, before that, I didn't okay. have access to someone to teach me. But these things are available. Even if you don't have it, it's available online. Yeah. So s- about 17 years old is when you started doing this technique and you did it for a few months. And then what? Like you, you got to 18 years old and then what? I think I, I mean, sounded when- more British. I felt it myself. There was no one to correct it. Even now, that's why I say I'm not sure if my accent is that good because it's never been evaluated by a British person to say that, okay, you're really great. You're good. You're bad. Probably you're how the do, first. <laughs> how do we evaluate someone's um, spoken English? Because so um, it's a question I get a lot. People say they want to have a British accent. Mm-hmm. And, and stuff like that. And the thing that I usually say these days is that actually the most important thing is that you're clear. Yes. Who was I talking to this talking to about this? It was Chales from uh, uh, the Stories of Language Learners podcast. He's he's from mm-hmm. Brazil, mm-hmm. and he was talking. I was talking to him about this, like a Portu- a Brazilian Portuguese speaker, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now it's possible for that person to just sort of say things that are let's say quote unquote wrong like pronouncing words in ways that people will not understand them so if he is saying internet Mm -hmm. right which it means internet Mm -hmm. right but it's just like a very strong brazilian portuguese pronunciation of internet Mm -hmm. people are not going to understand similarly if you say the word banana and you put the stress on the wrong syllable banana right that's also going to be a problem But that's not so much accent, that's just intelligibility. So I think personally, my first um, criteria for judging someone's spoken English is intelligibility. Mm -hmm. And are you clear? This has to be the most important thing. And then after that, you've got the identity side, which is like, you know, uh, you sound like you're from a certain place or you sound Mm -hmm. like certain other people. So in terms of your English, I mean, in terms of the intelligibility side, it's just excellent. Um, it really really is I mean um, and my position is that I don't require um, people to have a certain accent Mm -hmm. great Um, the main thing is that you're clear but I mean you you know your accent does sound quite British Mm -hmm. um, you can you can hear where the the British influences come in Um, (laughs) but the thing I'm interested in mostly is the intelligibility part and yeah you're totally intelligible it's it's really it's really amazing uh, i love meeting people like you who have you know learnt english to a good level on their own and for me it's kind of a mystery because i'm just like i mean i've been teaching english for 20 years right mm-hmm. and you know doing this podcast for 12 years or whatever it's still a mystery to me 
Uh, it's still amazing, like a sort of um, uh, 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 what's the word for it? Um, why can't I think of this word? This is when someone does an amazing magic trick, and it's a miracle. Yes, it's sort of miraculous when when it really works. And I'm just like, but wait, what you did this, and then what, and then what happened? And but like, well, I, I have to say, for all the people I've spoken to, uh, all the Wispolet runners up I've spoken to, it's the same thing. I'm just like, exactly. but but, and then and then just you're just English, just poof, it just happened. It's. You know, I really think uh, yeah. that even though I have tried to speak very precisely, but I don't want to make this impression that, first of all, to make people anxious about, okay, you have to use this method. Of course, there have been lots of people much better than me, not in terms of accent only, but in terms of their um, vocabulary, grammar, everything. They are... They didn't use these methods at all. I don't want to say that you have to use this method or to be anxious that you're not working on an accent, as you said. This was just what I loved to do. And I liked the way that it was like a game and also like an art maybe sometimes to make this sound. So that's how I approached it. And I like it as kind of this in this way. Um so so if it's not necessarily a specific seven step method or whatever mm-hmm. uh, what do you think are the most important sort of foundational things yes yes um, well mm-hmm. so that people can make sure that they're hitting these foundations and then they can build their own methods but as long as these principles are in mm-hmm. place what what do you think some of those things are well maybe learning the foundations and the fundamental sounds so for example using that sounds of english course or maybe learning the phonetic alphabet so one is that so you will not be unnecessarily uh confused when you hear the world the word for example world the word enthusiastic <laughs> for example because it can be broken up into many different sounds Something like that, or maybe more difficult words. So that's Mm -hmm. step one very important thing. Then lip syncing and uh, giving your mind and giving your body enough time to um, get get really comfortable with how to shape the words and sentences and then judging the way that you sound. So that's step five to seven. Those are the most important things. And maybe most of the time I used uh, these more than other ones. So I didn't always transcribe, as I said. I would say maybe built into that idea of like lip syncing before you actually start mm-hmm. producing the sounds yes. is the sense that, um, yeah, you've got to build time into it and you've got mm-hmm. to build physical practice mm-hmm. into into what you do. And also um, be careful of your own expectations. Mm-hmm. Yes. Don't expect to produce great results from the beginning. You've got to do it again no, and again yes. and again and again. So it's like patience, time and um, and physical you know, yes. don't underestimate the physical side of the actual working on on the mouth and the tongue and the whole body and all that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And mm-hmm. also your podcast has helped me to make it more natural because sometimes I listen to uh, my recordings. For example, I recorded uh, the first part of the, that Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare. I just like to do that, the preface. And mm-hmm. it sounds very mechanical to me now that I listen to it. I think I put uh, too much stress on some of the words. I spoke too quickly and... It, it's just something that you have to hone as time goes by it will happen and you cannot expect to do it perfectly even after a couple of years so it's just one part of it and also there are lots of beautiful things in learning a language like as I said reading literature um, writing some being able to read uh, technical books and course books and um, textbooks and um, poems. I don't know, lots of things. They are really interesting as well. So just don't focus on um, becoming a robot that follows one technique. Enjoy learning this. It's really important, I think. I don't want to... Yeah, yes, I think the 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 text that you choose, and by by text I mean reading text or listening text, mm-hmm. so the podcast or whatever that you choose is important because <laughs> it's got to reflect a certain target version of the language for you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, I mean you said if it's British English, then obviously a British English podcast with someone whose voice that you like. Mm-hmm. But I think the point about see transcriptions are a bit tricky because what you actually want is um, authentic natural spontaneous english Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a script and sometimes what happens like i mean at an elementary level it's totally fine and understandable to use pre-written dialogue that's been written in advance and then recorded but i think as you start to develop 
it's important also to be repeating and working with um, spontaneous English. Exactly. So if people are choosing to use my podcast, they might want to... So the, the intros to my episodes often have scripts on mm-hmm. the website, and that's fine. But those things are scripted. But the moments maybe where people should be repeating are the unscripted bits, like bits yes, of dialogue or exactly. con- natural conversation, because that's that's where you get the rhythm and you get mm-hmm. a certain kind of tempo that um, is normal in normal spoken English. Absolutely true. I think they can completely forget about step, uh, transcribing steps. As I said, I didn't um, do this every time with this method. Right now for Italian, I do because I'm at a very low level. But as you said, for people who listen to your podcasting can become cumbersome and intimidating to uh, transcribe always, uh, for example, an hour and 30 minute podcast. So they can forget about it. It won't... I I think that I added it just because improving listening and writing at the same time. But it, oh no, it's, it's yes. definitely good. I, I would say it can be intimidating. Can you think, oh, am I going to sit down and do this for yes. ages now? But I would say even just doing it 10 minutes a day. And mm. again, human nature tells us that we have to finish a thing. Like if you're mm. reading a book, you must finish the book. And if you're transcribing an episode, you've got to do the whole episode. You don't. Mm-hmm. You can, I've, I said many years ago that my podcast is like a rotary sushi bar. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that episode, but the rotary yeah. sushi bar of English is basically what my podcast is. And the thing about a rotary sushi bar is that it goes round and round and round and plates of delicious looking sushi come past you and you can just watch them as they go past or you can take one if you want and mm-hmm. my podcast is kind of like that it's think of it as being like a rotary sushi bar where it's just constantly in movement there's just constantly english being spoken mm-hmm. as it and it exactly. and it comes past you and you can just reach out and just take bits of it it, it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be a start and a finish yes. it's just a rolling um it's just rolling english and you can just dip in and dip out mm-hmm. so transcribe for 10 minutes every day uh, whatever section of the podcast you want but yeah you probably need um, a transcript if you're going to do the sort of the transcribing thing seriously or you could just get involved in the transcript project yes. on the website and that mm-hmm. then you can just do three minutes of audio each mm-hmm. time yes yeah. and can i add something i want to say that even though i've said this in this kind of mechanical way and also you said that it's like a mystery i believe it is truly something that we will never understand fully and we shouldn't look at it like an ob- too object too much objectively i think the way that um we shouldn't say that okay language learning is like this and like that and you have to follow this you have to follow this is a kind of um i like to say it we're endowed with it it's a gift it's a god-given gift that we can speak and we can we should cherish it we should be uh, enjoying this and there is mm. i think there have been this is an active studying thing that i've done it was a game i enjoyed it but i had much more relaxed studying like listening to podcasts watching my favorite uh, animations in english listening to audiobooks only to enjoy the story for example this lord of the rings uh pod, um, audiobook i've never seen the book itself i just listened mm. to the story i loved it and i think it taught me a lot so it's uh, these are just tools and tips nothing more than that yes yes absolutely yeah. motivation is is a big deal but i mean it's hard to tell people to be motivated you've got to just find your own motivation for it mm. i mean for you it was like right there was a moment where you actually said to yourself right well i better knuckle down and do this <laughs> and it paid off but also uh, other kind of principal or foundational ideas, motivation, find it somehow. <laughs> I mean, it's up to you to do that. Uh, regular practice, as mm-hmm. we've said. So daily practice of some kind. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, go easy on yourself. It could just be listening and enjoying. Yeah. Or you could be, be more active and do some mm-hmm. of the things that uh, you've just mentioned. Uh, try and find things that bring joy to you. Mm-hmm, exactly. So a lot of people when they decide they're going to learn English, they immediately go to the BBC News. And I've talked about this a lot. It's just the most depressing thing in the world. Exactly. It's it's really difficult to understand. Everyone speaks like this in a very unnatural way. And it's just like totally the wrong thing to go for. It's just going to make you miserable and demotivated. (laughs) You've got to find something that brings you joy. So if that's if that's like listening to stupid conversations between myself and my friends, then yes, go exactly, for it. Exactly. I think there are, for my education, um, I, for example, care about also, also, oh, 
what am I saying? Although it's really important. I think we need to focus on beauty, knowledge, goodness, all of these together. So everything that we learn, it should give us something um, from all of them. So focusing on beautiful things in English, um, for example, stories, I don't know, songs, uh, films, plays, all of these things, daily conversations, these are much more enjoyable than looking at everything analytically. You know, even in science, for example, I sometimes hate reading my course books because I think the person that wrote them was really a dull and a knowing person. He could use a very poetic language to describe, for example, a plant, mm. but he used a very boring and bloody <laughs> accent, not, not accent, <laughs> but tone. I really don't like listening to it. So for example, there are courses online courses, online books, for example, for learning um, subjects and uh, different technical things, I think. That's why I care about beautiful English a lot, learning beautiful words and uh, literature, at the same time, academic English and things like that, so that I can combine them and I don't sound like a very boring person because these things are not boring. For example, science, they're all kind of very beautiful but people have made us hate it all because they are boring people who have written yeah. them. Yes. Yeah, I think there's beauty to be found in everything. It is kind of like the force is, you know, binds the galaxy together. Exactly. And, you know, in a, in a sense, it's just a question of trying to find it in whatever you're doing and bringing some joy to, to things just, just makes everything so much better. I don't know why everything can't be a lot more enjoyable exactly. and why we can't find the fun in everything you know i just totally think it's possible but yeah it's weird maybe maybe certain people and their their, their kind of mindset imposes um mm -hmm. sort of boringness onto onto subjects but it's in there everything's you know fun and enjoyable is in there um, wow. So, so thank you for sharing your seven step technique. Um, uh, I want to ask you some other things too, but I uh, you know, we can at least wrap up this part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, is there anything else to add in terms of your English? So you had your technique, but when, I mean, you must have also done quite a lot of actual communication in English and, and, you know, conversation and also different, you know, practicing different situations and things too it's really right? strange it's really strange that when i look back i didn't have lots of language partners really but i was very talkative and i talked to myself a lot a lot and i talked about beautiful things as i said I, the things that i loved and i for example described this book that i loved to myself i was really comfortable with talking to myself even though having a partner is great I think it's just fantastic having a um, teacher, a partner. I was very active in uh, language classes as well. I was always saying something. My teacher mm. always said that, that uh, my mm. mouth was all the time open. But um, <laughs> but I didn't have lots of authentic conversations like I'm having with you until now. That's, I think, a pity. And also... Um, wow, that's amazing. I, I, I think it's strange, honestly. I don't want to say that um, I'm a particularly talented person. No, no way. I just want to say that even though we think it's absolutely necessary to have a lot of conversation with language partners, I didn't have it, truly. I used to talk. I did speak, but I talked to myself, not to someone else. You're, I, you're like a, a, a colleague of mine that I used to work with, Emina, who was on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she she talked also about talking to herself a lot mm -hmm. and developing her own fluency in that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A, a lot of people, I think, hear these things. They hear things like, you've got to talk to yourself, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. And they just kind of go, nah. And then they don't do it. Maybe so they I don't just know. don't enjoy it. It's fine, you know. But yeah. it, it's really more enjoyable to talk to other people. But mm, yeah, different yeah. learning styles, different things work for different people. But yeah. I guess if we if we you know go back to the principles, which are mm -hmm. regular practice, bringing doing something that you really enjoy, exactly. um, and um, um, yes, s certain types of practice on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I mean, motivation surely here is the is the main thing because you were so kind of into it all the way through. And I mean, I guess this is the thing that language, learning language is a deeply personal thing because essentially you are learning a new sort of paradigm in which you express yourself, a new mm -hmm. uh, context in which you be yourself. Mm -hmm. And that can only be a personal thing. And so it should be learned in a personal way. 
mm-hmm. which means you've got to find your own specific way of doing it. You've got to put yourself right in the heart of it mm-hmm. so that, you, in, like yes. in your case, you were speaking out loud, sharing your thoughts all the time, only doing the things that you really enjoyed doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you'd decided your reason for, for doing it. Mm-hmm. And, and, I mean, the results are clear. So... Maybe that's another thing. Personalization is so important. And just, I guess it goes along with doing what you really enjoy or, or trying to find the joy in, yes. in your practice. Yes, I reminded myself of the fact that English is even more important than my school. That's really strange to my uh, classmates because I was, as I said, I was quite a nerd. I studied a lot in school and I attended a very harsh schooling system. They were really um um strict strict very yes but um for my classmates the only thing in the world was their books of the universe of the school they didn't care about english and i was kind of that weird person that is always studying english why are you studying english so much it's it is the fact that i love to do um go to another country to study Mm. But, uh, and I also loved my language and I still do love Persian as well. But Mm. the thing is, um, I knew also because of that travel experience that if I don't learn English, I will never be able to be outside of this box and I will only have the opportunity to communicate with my community and I won't be able to leave, uh, to, um, read other books in other languages, even these subjects that I'm learning. They will, n- they will always be limited. So learning at least one other language was always more important than them because without language, what can we do? So even in, in anything, we first need to learn the language. For example, in chemistry, we need to learn the language of chemistry. For uh, speaking kind to each other in a kind way, uh, we need to learn how to speak and the language. It's our communication. So language is more Im- was more important than my school subjects. So if I had to choose... I would choose learning English in my day before starting mathematics, even if I love them, even if both of them are important. That's strange, but that was the mindset that helped me. But my classmates didn't have this mindset and they always Mm. push English. They put it aside. No, for later, you know, we're not going to do that. I wonder why, I wonder why you had that mindset and they didn't. Um, It's funny, isn't it? Yes. I I had a mystery. Uh, (laughs) I had really come to this conclusion myself. Maybe I went there and I saw that without language. In fact, we have, um, I don't know if we have time to talk about this, but uh, there is, there are many um, nice stories. I want to also say that because I try to investigate, investigate our own literature, Persian literature. And there are some stories that tell us about this, that, for example, there were four men that where all of them, they were given one um, coin to buy something and they decided to buy um, a fruit, okay, a kind of fruit, a grape, some, some grape. And all of them, they were from different countries. And for example, the Persian one said that I want angur, which is in Persian for grape. Uh, the Arabic one say, said the Arabic uh, word for angur <laughs> or, or grape. Mm-hmm. And the Roman person said it in that. And they were fighting with each other because they didn't know they were looking for the same thing. They are looking right. for grape. So yeah. the poet, uh, which was Molavi, maybe some people know him, or Rumi, it is from him, said that there was needed a person that knew all of these languages to help them keep calm and just understand each other. I think in everything, in philosophy, in our religion, in our uh, science, everything, just because we don't understand each other's language, we think we are talking about different things and we fight with each other. So what is better than learning a language or learning each other's language to end the fight? Yeah, Absolutely. Very, very well put. Mm, I... Very, very well put indeed. So English, in this case, becomes a force for global peace. Yes, and maybe understanding. exactly. It's not important that it's English. It's it has happened yeah. to be English, but yeah. learning languages is important. I think we need to care about it, but in a meaningful mm. way. Mm. Wow! I Amazing. <laughs> no, no, this is great. This is great. This is great. Um, actually, I did want to ask you one more thing. You trained to to become a, an English teacher. You did a CELTA. Yes, I did. Which is this? You may have heard me say this on the podcast in uh, other episodes. That it seems that a lot of the people who who won or were runners up in this competition mm-hmm, well, uh, were English teachers, and okay. some people seem to think that's a problem. I don't know what 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 do you think? Is there a 
problem here? I mean, I, wh- why is it that if someone has got their English up to a good level to the point where they they can become an English teacher, why does that mean that their story does not count? I don't really well, understand the thinking. Uh, me too, but I should say that, for example, I became an English teacher one year ago, okay? So yeah. I needed to reach a good level before that, as you said. So the whole, all of the things, important things happened before becoming a teacher. But I think being an English teacher that is not a native speaker is really difficult and mm. it has its own challenges. For example, now that uh, even though I should say I'm not super experienced, I'm just a, t- a very young teacher. Um, I have a lot to learn. For example, in comparison to you, you are my grandfather of English teaching. So I'm just that baby <laughs> that has just started. And I think, and I haven't even found a job in Italy yet. I don't know why. They don't want me, apparently. But I think it's because of the situation. They don't need any more teachers, at least in the place that I uh, live in. And there are some barriers and obstacles for a non native English teacher. Absolutely. Yeah. Even if you have a quite similar accent to a native speaker, it's still um, not that appealing to them. Yeah, you know? it's a huge issue in the industry. Yes. Uh, they call it native speakerism. Yes. And this is where you've got one person who is, is an experienced language learner. They've got qualifications, blah, 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 uh, versus uh, just a native speaker. Mm-hmm. And in many cases, it's the native speaker who gets the job, yes. even though they're not nearly as qualified or experienced mm-hmm. or, or insightful about yes. the process of, of learning a mm-hmm. language. I mean, you, yeah, it must be, yeah, it must be difficult. Also, students that you, that you end up teaching will carry those attitudes too. In fact, a lot of the time, the industry mm-hmm. uh, does these things because of the attitudes of the learners that they're like, yes. you know, they're the ones who complain if they don't get yes. a native English speaker in front I of see. them. I see. For the teacher, I think it's complicated because, for example, for language analysis, it's like a never ending process for me before the classes. I, right now, I just teach uh, Persian students in a language school, online language school, because I just mm. don't want to forget all I learned in the CELTA course. That yeah. was a nightmare for me at that point. I loved why my- was it. Why was it a nightmare? Doing, doing the, the CELTA? Uh, I think that the teacher trainers were amazing. They were really lovely people. They helped us to uh, be comfortable. But it was intensive CELTA in one month and a half. And it was online. <laughs> one of the very first online CELTA courses. And um, we were teaching through Zoom. So it was the first time I used Zoom. And mm. it was in the middle of my university courses as well. And it took me it took uh, thoroughly <laughs> it took me for one month and a half so i was all into that celta for one month and a half and nothing else just celta just english teaching and i expected a bit more after that but i saw that no it's really difficult to find a job at least it seems difficult in the place that i am at the age that we're in after this coronavirus i really yeah. prefer to go and teach in person i just hate this online thing all the time <laughs> We're learning um, online, university online, our families online, everything online. <laughs> it sucks, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And I prefer to work at least in person, but right now it's not really that uh, possible because of the situation. But I understand it. I'm happy that I did it. It taught me a lot, just becoming a teacher, no matter what other people think about you as a non-native English teacher. But the fact that English means a lot to me, just like languages mean a lot to me. And also, I think I learned so much from teaching. So, yeah, you, and yeah. you clearly have uh, so much to offer in terms of I your so. own process of learning the language yourself. I mean, this is surely invaluable um, advice and experience that you can mm-hmm. share with your with your students. This is the thing, you know, that mm-hmm. um, learn non native teachers of English are often the best coaches because mm-hmm. they've been there, they've done it, they've been through the whole process themselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, I th- I used to work in a great school in London, and I've you know worked in other yes, schools I've and stuff it. where mm-hmm. it was a combination of mm-hmm. of native English speakers and non native English speakers. Everyone was qualified to the same mm-hmm. level, mm-hmm. and everyone you know we all shared our knowledge and stuff, and it was a great mix because mm-hmm. some of my best teaching experiences are ones where I worked with fellow 
um, fellow teachers who were not from the UK. So mm-hmm. we had, you know, teachers from Poland and, and Turkey and all sorts of places. Mm-hmm. I had really yeah. good, really nourishing teaching experiences working with these colleagues of mine because they gave me a perspective and insight into English and learning and teaching English that I wouldn't have had otherwise. I think that, um, you know, the best combination is when you get native and non-native speakers working together, sharing a sort of native view, native level understanding of the language and that kind of mm-hmm. L2 um, uh, uh, value that mm-hmm. non-native English speakers te- teachers have too. They've got the view from the outside sort yes. of thing. So it's, yeah, I think it's a mistake to just um say that non-native speaker teachers are mm-hmm, don't, mm-hmm. don't have the same value it's just a different kind of value yes thank you for your opinion i like it and also uh even though i should confess that become being a native uh, speaker of course is an advantage it's a great advantage for example you know some aspects of your language that uh some na- non-native speaker won't know but i'm not sure if they are really that relevant to teaching english area so not always not for all levels well, and not for every kind of english so for example maybe in academic english five years from now that i've studied Eng- in english i will be a better academic English teacher, EA, what is it, EAP? Um, English for E-A-P. Academic E-A-P. Purposes? Yes. EAP, yeah. Maybe. I'm not sure that I will follow that road, but I want to say that maybe that experience will be helpful for me as a non native speaker, even though I am a non native, non native, tongue twisted, <laughs> non native speaker, to, in comparison to someone who didn't study uh, in university. But wasn't yeah, that's speaker. right. <clears throat> Me as a native speaker of English, I guess I've got two distinct advantages, mm-hmm. maybe three. One of them is that I can just sort of like go into my head exactly. and just pick out like what is right and wrong just mm-hmm. by instinct. Exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's an a, that's a, a, that's a process I use a lot when I'm teaching. If someone says mm-hmm. something to me or if we're doing an exercise, I'll just run it through my head or say it out loud a few times until mm-hmm. I've like, no, 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 that's not right. Because, um, you know, you, you become like a human corpora of English. You know, mm-hmm. you've just got this database yes. of English in your head that you can just run phrases and grammar through it and exactly. just see if it works. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is that, um, yeah, knowledge of certain systems and situations like academic academic english as you said because i've been mm-hmm. through the uk university system mm-hmm. so exactly. i know the culture and the writing style and stuff like that mm-hmm. so there's the that side experiencing situations and i guess the third thing is maybe being a model of, of pronunciation that a bit like having that inbuilt knowledge of grammar and vocab mm-hmm. your pronunciation just sort of becomes a model and you can just you know just by speaking it people can 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 copy it but non-native speakers have a different sort of thing like um that you might have a much more comprehensive understanding of the grammar a lot of english teachers native english speaking english teachers have got no clue about grammar at all Mm -hmm. and and uh, it's not an advantage Mm -hmm. to suddenly have to try and work out the difference between present perfect simple and present perfect continuous when you have never studied grammar of any language is is a really really a real disadvantage but for someone like you who's been through you know the grammar of another language and you you kind of you those answers might come to you much more quickly and easily Mm -hmm. because you've had to answer them yourself yeah Mm. this has been really interesting i feel like the time has flown very quickly yes It's been fascinating to talk to you. I'm so delighted, really delighted to be on your podcast and talk to you. That's an honor, really. Yes. And I'm really grateful to uh, Lebsters for voting for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think they made a good decision there. Uh, Congratulations again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I really hope that listeners really got something useful from it. And um, I prayed for that in the beginning (laughs) that they get some yes, yes, because they really need to. um, They they have chosen me. So I wanted to be useful and say all that I knew. I really said pretty much all the English (laughs) techniques that I knew and yeah i hope seriously you've been really useful you you even had a seven step um (laughs) method i mean come on everyone (laughs) i think that i think that you you've definitely been useful you said that you had a pdf or an infographic version of this you're going to send it it to me i can share it with everybody i will okay yes all right 
but congratulations again thank you so much for preparing and for being so useful it's been fantastic <laughs> and you, um, I you. you know I, I said before it's like a miracle or something but I just find it inspiring to know that there are mm-hmm. people out there who sort of um, actually do certain things go beyond mm-hmm. the normal mm-hmm. routines and do certain things and it works this mm-hmm. is extremely encouraging for me too yes. as a teacher so it's, Very it's been great to hear that <laughs> Thank okay, you. well, take care. Have a nice Goodbye. afternoon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. So that was Bahar from Iran. Thanks again to Bahar for her contribution. She definitely put a lot of effort into preparing herself for this conversation, coming up with some clearly defined steps and thinking about how she could go into some specific details about the things that worked for her. So thanks, Bahar, for doing that. Um, You will see the hand-drawn infographic that Bahar created to show her seven steps. You'll see that on the page for this episode on my website and as the image for this episode on YouTube. And if you are watching or listening to this on YouTube, hello, hello, YouTube people. Don't forget to like and subscribe, of course, so that you can you know, get more of more content like this, more of my episodes. I do videos sometimes. um, And also my audio episodes go up like this onto YouTube with a with with a static image on the screen. So thinking about this conversation, I'll just make a, you know, a couple of comments here at the end. Perhaps the main point here is that you can create your own method for learning English. Just go with whatever works for you. There isn't one single best approach. You just have to make sure that you're working with English on a regular basis, that you do things which bring you some joy. I mean, there's no point slogging away with something that you just don't like doing. So you need to try to, you know, make it enjoyable for yourself somehow. You should attempt to maintain a positive and beneficial cycle in your approach to English. Try to find your own personal motivation for learning the language and say to yourself, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it my way. And then just put in the time. And like Baha said, it is worth learning about the foundations of English pronunciation, the phonemic script and, um, you know, how those different sounds are made. It's worth putting the time in to learn that stuff. Some people are are maybe a bit put off by the idea of of that, but um, you know because you think, oh God, I don't, I d- it's going to be too difficult to learn a whole separate alphabet. But it's worth it. It really is. You know, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Work with the phonemic script. What you could do is. Uh, Don't just look at the sounds and work out how they're pronounced and stuff, but try transcribing words and sentences into phonemes. Um, That can be good practice. Just even just words, transcribe words into phonemes and then use an online dictionary to check your transcription. That can be a good way to do it. Um, And also don't um, underestimate the importance of just spending plenty of time listening and don't apply too much pressure to yourself. Let it happen naturally and in its own time. And I hope that my podcast helps to make this easier. Again, check the page for this episode on my website where you'll find links to things that Baha mentioned, including the BBC Sounds of English pronunciation course, British Council elementary podcasts, and so on. But that is it for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Leave your comments and feedback in the comments section. And have a fantastic day, night, morning, afternoon or evening. And I will speak to you soon. But now it's just time for me to say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.